It's a cloudy Saturday morning more than 28 years ago, May 26, 1990. Marlene Warren's at home on her sprawling property in Wellington, Florida. It's an upscale but rural town nestled between the palm trees of the beachside cities along the Atlantic and the alligator-infested wilds of the Everglades. Marlene's 21-year-old son Joey is home too, finishing breakfast with several of his friends. A car pulls into the circular driveway and the driver steps out. It's a clown. Orange wig, red bulb nose, white painted face. It walks casually to the front door and knocks. Marlene answers, still dressed in her pink nightgown. Joey and his friends hear her exclaim, How sweet! The clown's delivering balloons and a bouquet of carnations arranged in a white basket. And something else. A bullet. From the South Florida Sun Sentinel in association with Wondery, this is Felonious Florida, the podcast that leads you into the dark side of the Sunshine State. I'm Emma Kate Austin, along with reporter Tanya Alanez. And this is part one of The Killer Clown of Wellington. The scene of a clown gripping a gun on Marlene Warren's doorstep was surreal, and over in seconds. The clown fired one bullet into Marlene's face, and she died two days later. But the investigation into the murder was just as extraordinary. It would lead police into the darkest corners of Florida. They found accusations of loan sharking, cocaine dealing and drug smuggling, insurance fraud, chop shops, racketeering, used car lots and stolen cars, seedy affairs, prostitutes, plots and threats. This wasn't Marlene Warren's life. It certainly wasn't when she was growing up in Michigan. Marlene McKinnon was a happy girl who spent part of her youth on her grandfather's farm in a town north of Detroit. She was the middle of two sisters, Debbie and Leanne. The family liked to bake together, especially cookies, says her mom, Shirley Twing. Out of the three, she was a, what you might call a leader. Okay? They would follow. She just took over things. Okay? She was not uh, tough, it's just, she, she carried on a conversation very well. Yeah. And, and those kids had a good time doing things, cooking, and she cooked, she liked to cook. She the, making cookies, of course. That and uh, being out on the farm and, and raised on the farm helped. Marlene's family moved around a lot, including spending years in California before returning to Michigan. We moved too much. Uh-huh. I don't think I had anything on the wall at that time when she was born, you know. As a girl, Marlene liked to draw and paint. Shirley still has a paint-by-number picture of a clown her daughter did when she was 14. He's wearing a tiny hat on top of unruly hair and an oversized polka-dotted bow tie. He has a red nose, and his eyes are almost as sad as the deep frown Marlene painted on his face. Marlene was exceptionally young when she married her husband John Aarons and became a mom. She gave birth to her first son when she was just 15 years old. By the time she was 18, she was the mother of two boys. Shirley recalls meeting John. They were at Marlene's grandmother's house in New Haven, Michigan. John was trying to impress Marlene with his car and was driving down a gravel road. But it was icy, and his car slid and crashed into a tree in the front yard. And that's when we met them. We went out and he had a bump on his head. And <laughs> I, can, I can remember that, that part. It was kind of funny. Marlene's parents don't remember exactly when she met and married John, but they remember when she lost him. It wasn't long into the marriage. Marlene and John had just had their two sons, John Jr. and Joseph. They were toddlers when tragedy struck. John was involved in a car crash in Texas and didn't survive. Marlene was a widow and single mother before she was even 20 years old. Here's reporter Tanya Alanez. Portions of Marlene's early life are pretty hard to put together. Her mother and stepfather are elderly now and live in Las Vegas, and their memories of dates and events aren't that clear anymore. They're not too sure what year Marlene married her first husband or where and when he died, other than it was in a car accident somewhere in Texas. Marlene didn't wait long to make a new start. 
Within just a few years, she'd met Michael Warren and they married in 1972, when Marlene was 22 and Michael was 19. The Warrens lived in Michael's hometown of Mount Clemens, Michigan, a suburb of Detroit. But that too wasn't for long. Michael had family in Florida, Marlene's mother said, and the couple made the decision to relocate there to raise the boys. They bought a home in Palm Beach County, lived in it for a short time, then resold it when the market went up. Then they did it again and again, building up more wealth each time. They also started buying rental properties, and Marlene spent her days managing the units and dealing with tenants. Michael opened a used car lot. By the late 1980s, their businesses were paying off. The Warrens were, by outside appearances, living the American dream. They bought an acre of land and built a 6,500-square-foot home in a new, exclusive community in Wellington. It's called the Arrow Club, and it's about as far west as you can go in Palm Beach County before you're in the Everglades. There's not much that's modest about the Arrow Club development. The homes are spacious, most with long, circular driveways, swimming pools, and meticulous landscaping. Arrow Club gets its name from perhaps its most unique feature, a private airstrip, and the taxiways that lead to each home around it. The Warrens was one of them. It was at 15470 Take Off Place, and the lot had plenty of space to park Michael's airplane. William Kramer lived behind the Warrens. He's a former Navy pilot and said Aero Club was designed specifically for people who like to fly. Wellington is a community west of West Palm Beach. It's a large development that started in the 70s. has a different pieces of the area. Some people uh, live on a little lake there that have their own little boats. Some live uh, on uh, areas that have horses. There's a polo field here, which gets some notoriety sometimes. And people who are interested in general aviation um, could buy a home and actually have an airplane that they could taxi out of their backyard and get to a runway and uh, enjoy the, the thrill of flying. The Warrens I had met, incidentally, I knew who they were. They knew who I was. We would say hello. The dream life in Aero Club didn't come easy for Michael and Marlene. They worked long hours to get it. After arriving in Florida, Michael took a job as a meat inspector for the state, then started selling cars around 1983. He'd place ads in newspapers and made enough sales to eventually open the used car lot in Riviera Beach. He made extra money on the side by selling meat. By 1990, Michael's car business had taken off. He was running Bargain Motors, a bigger used car lot and leasing business. It was on busy North Dixie Highway in West Palm Beach. Ropes of bright lights were strung over the lot. A post dozens of feet high towered overhead, capped with an oversized model of a car and a yellow sign with Bargain written in oversized red letters. While Michael's car business was taking off, Marlene had her hands full managing rental properties the Warrens had acquired. They would buy land and build duplexes and apartments. They rented the units and used the profits to buy even more land and build more rentals. Even with the help of her son Joey, it wasn't easy for Marlene managing the properties, especially collecting rent. She hated evicting tenants who couldn't pay. She was hardworking in uh, all those uh, buildings that they rented out and stuff. Those were, that was her project. All those... Uh, all the, all the buildings that uh, was rented, that was, like I said, she took care of them along with uh, Joe. And if something went wrong, she, she and uh, Joe would go over and work on it. That type of thing. Kept the plumbing going the whole nine yards. Most of their property was in Westgate, a densely packed, poor neighborhood of small ranch homes that abuts the north side of Palm Beach International Airport. By 1989, Michael and Marlene owned 17 pieces of property in Palm Beach County. Their property taxes that year totaled $21,000, and they paid all but $5,100. Finally, the couple had saved enough money to buy the huge lot along the Aero Club's airstrip, and they built a ranch home that was valued in 1990 at $175,000. But actually, Michael didn't own any of it. Everything the couple had, the Aero Club home, the investment properties, the car dealership, all of it, was in Marlene Warren's name. Hi, this is Emma Kate Austin. What would it look like if we all listened more? Audiobooks motivate us, inspire us, even bring us closer together. And there's no better place to listen than Audible, where you'll find the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet. And now, with Audible Originals, the selection has gotten even more custom with content made just for members. I know you love true crime stories, and Audible has a new book about the most fearsome serial killer in U.S. history, who was executed in Florida almost 30 years ago. It's called Ted Bundy, the horrific true story behind America's most wicked serial killer. Author Ryan Becker tells you how this handsome, charming, and ambitious man could carry his ugly, violent hatred so secretly and for so long. Audible has a great offer for listeners of Felonious Florida. Get your first audiobook free and choose two titles from a curated list of Audible originals when you try Audible for 30 days. Just visit audible.com Florida or text Florida to 500-500. Every month, Audible members get one credit for any audiobook they choose, plus two Audible originals from an exclusive, changing selection. Get your free audiobook today by going to audible.com Florida.
That's A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash Florida or by texting Florida to 500-500. Audible. You can do it with audiobooks. By 1990, the Warren family had been in Florida for about 17 years. And in that time, Michael and Marlene had amassed $1.1 million in property across Palm Beach County. But the signs of trouble had already started. In the spring of 1983, Michael was still selling used cars through newspaper ads when he got caught rolling back odometers. He had purchased a 1981 Oldsmobile with nearly 50,000 miles from a fleet company in Fort Lauderdale. Then he listed it for sale in the newspaper with 25,000 miles. A Boca Raton man bought the car, and when he did, he signed a blank odometer verification form. He told police that Michael never identified himself as a car dealer and Marlene was the one who notarized the blank form. Later, the title arrived from the state of Florida, and it listed the mileage on his newly bought car as almost double what he thought it was, 45,232 miles. He reported the discrepancy to authorities. Michael was charged with odometer tampering, a third-degree felony. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to 18 months of probation. A second charge involving another customer and a 1981 Chevy was dropped under the terms of a plea deal. Michael was ordered to pay $1,500 to the purchasers. Michael's illegal activity wasn't the only thing that was rocking the Warrens' seemingly ideal life. There was also tragedy. On September 23, 1988, John Jr. was driving his five-year-old Datsun near the South Florida Fairgrounds about nine miles from their Aero Club home. Just before 11 a.m., he apparently failed to stop at an intersection and slammed his car into an Oldsmobile driven by a 49-year-old woman. The other driver was taken to the hospital with minor injuries and released. But Johnny died at the scene at age 22. The tragic loss of her oldest son jolted Marlene and strained her marriage to Michael. Her surviving son, Joey, told the 48 Hours News program that after Johnny's funeral, Michael was hardly ever home. Action spoke louder than words, Joey said. He wasn't around. The problems with Marlene and Michael's marriage only got worse. And one day, in a courthouse about a year before Marlene's murder, a secret conversation took place that foreshadowed the fateful tragedy that was coming for the Warrens. Seven months after John Jr.'s death, the Warrens were back in court. This time, it was Marlene's younger son who was in trouble. Joey and about eight of his friends um, were out to get revenge after one of their buddies was beat up at a party. That happened on August 10th, 1986. Supposedly, Joey was the one who riled the whole group up and got them to set out to um, go attack their victim. So the angry group piled into Joey's um, Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme, and they headed over to Gallagher's apartment, and that was in West Palm Beach. When they got there, it was, I think, about three in the morning, and five of them knocked on Gallagher's door. When he answered, one of the guys hit him in the head with the nunchucks, and the rest of them jumped, beat, and knifed him. They stabbed Gallagher four times plunging the blade five to six inches deep each time. An ambulance rushed him to the hospital for emergency surgery. His small intestine and diaphragm were punctured. The tip of his pancreas was cut and his lacerated spleen had to be removed. And he had been stabbed in the back, right between his shoulders. Police tracked the attackers down and arrested Joey three weeks before his 18th birthday, charging him with attempted second-degree murder. It took three years for the case to be resolved in a plea deal. Michael and Marlene went with Joey to court, where a judge was scheduled to review the deal. He was going to plead guilty to a lesser charge of aggravated battery and was looking at six months in jail. But he got lucky that day, his lawyer Christopher DeSantis recalled. The judge decided that Joey was the least to blame of the other attackers. He was sentenced to six months of house arrest instead of jail time. But something else happened in court that day. It hinted that Michael and Marlene's marriage had started to take a darker turn. Joey's lawyer, Christopher DeSantis, recalled the scene in the Palm Beach County Courthouse. He was with Michael Warren, who wanted some legal advice. Marlene and Joey had moved out of earshot. According to a statement DeSantis later gave to police, Michael asked him what would happen to a wife's estate if her husband killed her. DeSantis said he was bewildered. He told police he thought Michael was, quote, nuts because why would you ask that question with your wife there? He told Michael that if somebody else did it and the husband couldn't be connected as an accessory to the murder, he'd get away scot-free. And DeSantis told police he gave more advice. And it was advice he says today he wishes he never gave. One way to get away with murder, DeSantis said he told Michael, would be to wear a disguise so nobody would be able to identify the killer, even whether it was a man or a woman. A disguise such as a clown suit, DeSantis told him. While the problems in Michael and Marlene's marriage simmered, over at Bargain Motors, Michael had acquired a motley crew of people to work the lot. They were mechanics and salespeople, car detailers, a secretary and bookkeeper, and repo men who went after customers who didn't pay. One day, one of his occasional repo men showed up at Bargain Motors in a tow truck. He was known by the name Spud, and he was a longtime friend of Michael's. 
On this visit, he brought along his wife. She bounded out of the truck, onto the lot, and into Michael's life. She was young and exuberant, a striking brunette with long, glossy hair. She had mischief in her big brown eyes. The office manager at Bargain Motors was Suzanne Gould, and she remembers the day the tow truck showed up. I just remember that that first encounter with her, never saw her before, and then bam, she's there. The very first time I saw her, I remember her her long, dark hair, and um, she was pretty, and she was very young. She showed up on the scene, never saw her before, never conversed with her over the phone prior to that time. Her name was Sheila Keene. She was a headstrong, independent 26-year-old with a game-for-anything reputation. Sheila spent more and more time on Michael's lot, and soon she was repossessing cars on her own. Fearless and tough as nails, she had no qualms about driving a flatbed truck into the roughest neighborhood to reclaim a car, and she was known to carry a gun. Sheila Keene was making herself right at home among the crew at Bargain Motors. The more time she spent there, the more responsibilities and duties she took on. It wasn't long before the others on the lot felt like Sheila had moved in and taken over. She was bossing everyone around. But Sheila's attention, all of it, went toward one person, her six-foot-one-inch blue-eyed boss, Michael Warren. One secretary who worked in the office said Sheila became possessive of Michael and eventually was all but running the lot. Suzanne Gould saw it too. Sheila had become infatuated with Michael. It was like... He was the only person there. She just seemed giddy in his presence. She was like a college um, college girl that was smitten, and she was overly dramatic in a in a flirtation way. It wasn't obvious to anybody but me, but I I just could see it. I could sense it. It was. It was something that I just knew. I didn't, I didn't even want to know. We, we were never going to be best girlfriends. <laughs> it's just, no. And everything that she was doing was directed towards one individual on the lot. Michael's twin cousins, Ronald and Donald Carter, also worked at Bargain Motors. Ronald later told police that, quote, Sheila Keene worshipped the ground that Michael Warren walked on. And Michael clearly had feelings for Sheila, too. She was a stark contrast to Michael's wife, Marlene, the strawberry blonde, blue-eyed, slightly pudgy housewife. Michael's relationship with Sheila was evolving into an affair. Michael Warren was a charmer who walked with an air of confidence that benefited him as a salesman. He was a people person with a penchant for racehorses, women, and good times. And he was committed to his business, eventually spending more time there than at home. He was a wonderful person. Um, his smile was, um, it was possessing. If you've ever met a salesman on a car lot and just felt, Completely, like, that was the most honest person and the most kind person. Um, on a daily basis, that's how he presented himself. He had a um, an air of confidence that just, it, it put a person at ease. He was there early in the morning. He was there late in the evenings. He seemed to be all about business. He just seemed like a wonderful, terrific human being. He had a beautiful smile, a good... Um, a good business set. I don't, he was just likable. Suzanne Gould's fondness for her boss was in spite of his shady business dealings. She knew there was unethical behavior going on at the lot, but she was a single mom and needed the money. There were definitely things going on that I knew were not legal, but at the time, um, I really needed to be working. One of Michael's former employees recalled a particular moment that showed the depths of the corruption at Bargain Motors. John Moran detailed cars with his father on Michael's lot. He told police that he was asked one day to help repossess a car, and it was an extraordinary scheme. Michael and Spud, Richard Keene was his real name, had Sheila dress up and pose as a prostitute so she could lure the customer into a motel room. John said that after he and his father took the car, they returned to the motel to pick up Sheila. In the room, he saw Sheila holding the man at gunpoint with a 45 caliber pistol. Michael and Richard were armed too, John told police. It didn't take long for the sexual tension between Sheila and Michael to surface for all to see. Their long lunches fueled speculation of an affair, and pretty soon it was unspoken knowledge that the two were more than friends. The interactions that they had, Michael Warren and, and she, um, seemed like something more than a business transaction. And she just seemed bouncy, bubbly, and 
you, you could just see something in her eyes. Like there was, there was something going on. There's body movements. There's eye contact. I'm not a professional, but I guarantee you somebody that studies the science of psychology, there was something going on there. Sheila's husband was also noticing the sparks between Michael and his wife, though Richard Keene didn't seem to care. But he did warn Sheila that, quote, she was going to get in trouble if she didn't stop working with that bunch. By January 1990, the Keens had split up. Their marriage was over. With Sheila completely free from her husband, Michael was spending a lot of time at her apartment in West Palm Beach. It was in a gated community of small, multifamily duplexes called Pine Ridge. They have tennis courts, a clubhouse, and a pool. In the middle of the 50 or 60 buildings is a pond with a fountain. Michael was coming and going at all hours, so often that neighbors were assuming he was Sheila's husband. He even started paying rent on her apartment. I think that she was smitten by Mr. Warren. And I think that they were trying to make it appear. I mean, obviously, if something was going on, you didn't want to make it obvious. But I just, I sense, and it was just something within me. And it's, I, I, I watch people. I'm a people. I've been a people watcher all my life. And I could just tell that there was something off. To some, Sheila and Michael made a good match. They both had wild streaks. They liked late-night repo runs and trips to the racetrack with friends. Two of those trips stuck out in the memory of Michael's cousin, Ronald Carter. Both times, he was taking them to Gulfstream Park to watch horse races. While he drove, Michael and Sheila were having sex in the back seat. Michael had a passion for horse racing, and he became more than just a spectator. He started a company called Mike Warren's Racing Stable Incorporated. Records listed it at the same address as Bargain Motors. And he went out and bought himself a racehorse to have trained, for no small amount of money, according to a neighbor's statement to police. In April 1990, Michael's three-year-old filly named Joyce Azaleen was raising at the National Jockey Club Oaks at Sportsman Park near Chicago. The purse was $90,000, and Michael's horse won. But the finish was disputed when Joyce Azaleen's jockey was accused of cutting off an opponent. She was bumped to second place, and the purse went to a horse named I Know a Secret. Michael appealed to the race board, but the decision was upheld. Michael made frequent trips to horse tracks around Florida with Sheila, friends, and relatives. Michael's mother, Joyce Clayton, was along on one of these outings. They went to Calder Racetrack in Miami Gardens. Sheila was there, and so was one of the Carter twins who worked at Bargain Motors, and his girlfriend. They went to a bar after the race, where Joyce questioned Sheila and her son about their relationship. She asked Sheila point-blank if she was in love with Michael. Sheila said she was. When Joyce asked her son about his feelings for Sheila, his answer was, I love myself. Joyce told Michael that he should divorce Marlene and give her half of their possessions. You're still young enough to do it again, she told Michael. But he wasn't having it. According to his mother, he replied, I'll see her dead before I'd split anything with her. One month later, Marlene Warren was dead. On the Saturday of Memorial Day weekend in 1990, Michael Warren was out of the house before 9 a.m., on his way to a day at the horse races. He stopped by Bargain Motors and met with a mechanic, then waited for two friends to pick him up. At about 10.45, they set out for Calder Racetrack about 60 miles away. Marlene and Joey were home in Wellington. Three of Joey's friends, who had stayed the night, were there too, along with his girlfriend's two-year-old son. Marlene had finished making instant eggs for breakfast and Joey was on the couch watching TV. His leg was in a cast after he broke his ankle in a car accident. At around the same time Michael and his friends were leaving Bargain Motors for the track, there was a knock on the front door in Wellington. Marlene was still in her pink nightgown when she answered it. The clown, with a curly orange wig, white face, and bulb nose, was staring back at her. In one hand, two foil balloons. One had Snow White on it, and the other said, You're the greatest. In the clown's other hand, a white basket filled with red and white carnations. Joey and his friends heard Marlene say, Oh, how sweet. The clown pulled out a gun. Police said it was either a 38 or 357 caliber pistol, and fired a single shot at point-blank range into Marlene Warren's face. Joey heard the pop. It sounded like a balloon had burst. But when Marlene crumpled to the floor, he rushed over to the front door. She was bleeding, and Joey frantically tried to figure out where the blood was coming from. Spit it out, Mom, he told her. Spit it out. The bullet had entered just above her upper lip and traveled to the back of her neck. Her two front teeth had been blown out. Fragments of bone, teeth, and metal were embedded in her tongue. Joey looked up and saw the clown ambling back toward the car, stopping and turning for just a moment to look at him. Long enough for Joey to see dark brown eyes staring back. The clown calmly walked back to the white Chrysler LeBaron and drove off.
As Marlene lay bleeding in the front doorway, Joey and his cast and one of his friends jumped into his mother's car and tried to chase the clown down. And poor Joe. He's in the middle of it. I feel bad for him. He's supposed to... He was in the room when uh, his mother was killed. And uh, he apparently chased, chased after it, got in the car and tried to catch, but couldn't. Joey wasn't quick enough and the clown's Chrysler was soon out of sight. An ambulance arrived at Aero Club and rushed Marlene to Palms West Hospital. She was barely alive with the bullet still lodged in one of her vertebrae in the back of her neck. Doctors put her on life support, but she never really had a chance. Marlene died two days later at age 40. On the Saturday of the shooting, crime reporter Jim DePaolo was listening to police scanners in the Palm Beach County newsroom of the South Florida Sun Sentinel. Police radio wasn't yet being streamed over the internet, so Jim sat in front of a bank of scanners that crackled with sirens and dispatchers. In 1990, it was the quickest way to hear about breaking news. Late in the morning, he caught a dispatch through one of the scanners. There's been a shooting in Wellington. It might have been a routine call in any of the big cities along Florida's southeast coast. But Wellington? Not there. Jim rushed to his car and drove to Aero Club. At the time, at first, all we knew is that somebody was shot in Wellington, which was a very, this area that they were in was in a very affluent area of Wellington, which was a newer city, right? And um, very small, sleepy kind of town. And that was unusual of itself, right? Um, but then when we got out there, we found out that um, it was somebody dressed up in a clown suit and that they shot the person and then just casually walked back to their car and drove away in a white Chrysler LeBaron with no license plate, still wearing the clown suit. The media jumped on the terrifying story that became national news. Who was the killer clown, and why did it murder a seemingly innocent housewife in cold blood? Police had a trail to follow almost immediately. Within two hours of the bullet hitting Marlene Warren's face, a call came into police that would focus the investigation close to home. An anonymous female caller said, you might want to ask Michael Warren and Sheila Keen a few questions. Then she hung up. They were really right away focusing on the husband, uh, almost immediately Michael Warren, as a potential suspect. The tip certainly made sense. Everyone had seen the way that Michael and Sheila were carrying on. But were they killers? Would this case really be so simple to crack? It would not. Marlene Warren's murder led to an extraordinary and baffling murder investigation. Police spent nearly three decades searching for the clown who showed up at her door with balloons and a pistol. Meanwhile, 800 miles away in a little tourist town called Abingdon in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, folks had no idea that the ruthless, killer clown could be living among them. That's next week on the conclusion of The Killer Clown of Wellington. Thanks for listening to this episode of Felonious Florida. If you're enjoying the podcast, please rate us on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends about our show. It's available online at feloniousflorida.com, Apple Podcasts, Wondery.com, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can go online to see photographs, video, and read more about the cases we're featuring at feloniousflorida.com. And be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Felonious Florida is produced by the South Florida Sun Sentinel and Wondery. The Killer Clown of Wellington was reported and written by Tanya Alanez and Mark Freeman, with additional reporting by Brianna Erickson in Las Vegas. And I'm your host and sound designer, Emma Kate Austin. Our producers are David Schutz and Juan Ortega. Editing by Randy Roguski. Sound direction by Sean Pitts, with additional recordings by Carlene Jean and Amy Beth Bennett. The Felonious Florida team includes Lisa Arthur, Dana Banker, Neuron Zoo, Danny Sanchez, and Kelly Fry. Hi, this is Tanya Alanez. Local journalism matters. Support us by joining the Sun Sentinel, South Florida's leading source for news, information, and entertainment. Visit sunsentinel.com slash join.